math. I chose math at the university because I had no idea what I was going to do when I grew up. And it was hard. And I liked that it was hard, but I could figure it out. So I took physics. I sort of like that it follows rules, but that those rules are human created. I sort of like the idea that it could be anything else. Like we have this math and we use it because it def sort of describes the world well, but you could imagine having somehow created a different mathematics. Um, and then pure math. Pure math starts to almost sort of overlap with what I think of as philosophy. Mathematicians would be angry that I'm saying this maybe, but, um, and it's just sort of like how far can we take these rules that we've made? Um, how sort of how how far can we move in these very abstract directions? And then often those abstract directions will circle back and and relate to the real world, which is uncanny. And I like that uncanniness. I think of it. Mm. Uh, math. I think that what math makes possible like deeply affects the world. I mean, I think that. Um, you can have small lidars and you have to triangulate. Um, they send out light pulses and, and then you have maybe two at airports. You have two lidars, they send out light pulses and you can get the movement of wind through that. Um, but you have basically like the, the, the question was, can we use one scanning lidar in, or, in order to measure the movement of wind in clear air? So using the backscatter from particles in the air, um, we were, pretty well able to measure the movement of wind like three to five kilometers away. So we have, you can mathematically model, right? In general, what's gonna be happening, but then every now and then you'd get some just completely crazy vortex coming through. And you could see, we had like three, three months of data and there's these very specific events that come through that you could never predict. Um, so, you know, you can do this sort of prediction on a, on average, it's gonna be this, but but then you have these sudden events, this sort of complexity, right? These sudden events, who knows what it came from, and you have a vortex going through, totally unpredictable. Um, math, I hated, like I really hated my computer science classes. I took them and it felt like if I liked them and could handle them, it would be a nice way to make money one day, and I just hated them. So I just got through it. I liked, I think I had a, upper division class in algorithms, and I liked that. Um, but, but definitely that education didn't compel me to work with code. The, like, the only thing that really compels me to work with code is having a problem that needs to be solved with code. I'm not particularly, um, I don't love the experience of writing code. It, that for me is not, I, I would rather not, honestly, but there's these questions and that's the way to solve them. And so that's what compels me, is just that practical. You know, if I have a huge data set and I want to visualize it, I'm not going to go draw something by hand. Um, I'm going to put them in the computer and do something with code, basically. I physically don't like, like, sitting in front of a computer for long periods of time. I, I just don't like it, so that's a part of it. And then much, much like, if I want to sit down and write write a bunch about something. I feel very fluent with that. I don't really have, I'm not at the level of fluency with any particular tool, with any particular programming language where I feel like I can just sit down and be totally fluent with it. And, and I feel, I find that it's frustrating in a way that is, I'm sort of in the place now where I'm trying to become more fluent and deciding if the uh, frustration is gonna be worth it over the long term. Um, I, I, this is, it's like a struggle I'm literally like right in the middle of right now. Am I going to keep trying to code this stuff myself or am I going to, you know, sort of back off, have ideas, do design and bring in other people to do the coding? And like, I'm right in the middle of it. So I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, I could, you know, certainly imagine some totally different tool set that's, I, I don't know, you know, coding could be some completely different thing. It doesn't have to be what it is, right? Like we've sort of made it and we just keep going in the same direction. Like it could have gone in some totally different direction. Um, yeah, but I mean, as it stands now, it's just not like a thing that I want to spend a lot of my time doing. Hmm. <laughs> Big data, I mean, is the classic sort of all the information that Facebook is collecting about you, everything you've clicked on. And, and then, I mean, data people, the best definition that I've seen of it um, is that it's large and it's relational. So, I mean, it's large in that you need 
you know, uh, enormous uh, capacity to hold it. But specific, I think more importantly that it's relational. So you don't just have, you know, you don't just have all the wind data from the world for a hundred years. You have the wind data plus, you know, plus, um, you know, other kinds of weather data, and you can put that together and maybe. I, th I mean, I think that the dream of big data is almost always predicting the future. Um, the way that we're able to work with big data now usefully is to apply data mining techniques to separate separate things into different groups is a, is a lot of what, which type of consumer are you? And um, so you, you can predict the future in terms of in terms of what's broadly going to be true, I think. But you can never sort of find, like, the vortex that's going to move through and kind of change everything. That's something that you... Yeah, so, I mean, so now you have this thing where people are creating their own personal archives, right, online. You have your... all your images that you've ever taken, you know, all the emails you've ever sent, and um, the younger people are, the more they have everything, basically, online. And other people do with like I don't really keep um, pictures and things like this so it's hard for me to relate to that very personal kind of data collection and management but yeah I know that people and I know it's like it's so important to people the the images over over a lifetime um, yeah. about things like memory and data and to sort of look at how data how we can create this sort of external memory from our data and how that compares to our actual memory. Um, I think email would be an easy thing to work with because everybody has that basically and not everybody has um, images or, you know, but um, I'm interested in data visualization now in the same way that I was interested in math, that I think it's sort of a hard problem to solve. It's complicated. There's the data and there's the design and there's, where truth lies and and um, and how to make it like effective, like how to how to make it an emotional resonant experience for people. Um, and so I like it because it's complicated in that way, and it's to some extent useful because people are paying attention to it right now. And so you can kind of talk about the things you want to talk about, and and people are listening. Um, I mean, we're still reading. I know I'm still reading, but I think that the things that are communicated in a visual language move around much faster now. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, right now, that's why I'm sort of doing the work of data visualization. But, and one of the things that I think is really problematic is how we will sort of color a whole country, like, you know, this country is at this poverty level and... And I think that that kind of aggregation is really problematic. Um, and I think that it's, I think the more often that we're thinking of people as groups, I actually think that's, I think that's bad. And I think that um, I would like to, to the extent that's possible. And so this is one of the things I'm interested in data visualization is to focus on, is to find ways to focus on the individual, um, whether that's and especially with human beings, I, I want to avoid as much as humanly possible um, aggregating people into groups. Um, and, and I think that data visualization and information visualization is like, we're, there's this long history, but there's not a long history of interactivity. Um, and I think we're right at the beginning of thinking about those questions. And I think that there's I think it's barely even begun as a field in terms of what interactivity might make possible, in terms of looking at the individual and then blowing up to a larger scale to sort of keep keep in mind the to the extent that people pay attention to data visualization. I think that it's important to to pull out those individual stories as much as possible. Where it fails, I think that. So one of the critiques that people have is that it's this eye candy sort of thing. It's this eye candy that sort of you just kind of look at and look away from. Um, and 
So this is actually going along with that critique, but I think that now we treat visualization as if it's a standalone object, whereas historically, it's, I, think, I think what like a visualization is, is a rhetorical tool, like the same way that, you know, an essay is a rhetorical tool. It's just a tool and a tool. And a good historical example is this Florence Nightingale's rose diagram, which she put together um, after she came back from the Crimean War. And it keeps track of, it shows how um, deaths occurred in the Crimean War amongst the troops in battle. And basically it highlights that most of the troops died because of infections that could have been fixed with better cleanliness practices, right? And so that's that we're taking ourselves way too seriously. I don't see enough like marriage of play and fun with, with visualization in general, but especially with these sort of, you know, we want to, if we want to take on you know, drones and gun deaths, these visualizations that came out this year. And I'm, I'm super happy that those things have come out. But we're sort of, it's always very serious. And so you're dealing with deaths and it needs to be serious, but there's, I think we're losing something in terms of marrying creative coding community. There almost seems to be a separation between people doing small, playful things and people doing these sort of serious, large projects. And I, I just wish there was more conversation between those groups. Yeah. The weight. Yep, to there's it. this gravity to the work, and, and other types of work and other sort of groups of people have a, more of a levity to their work, I think. I think it's also that, I mean, you, you can't, I don't know how you have levity when you're dealing with deaths, right? Like you have those gestural lines that represent um, lives in those visualizations. I don't know how to bring in the levity, but I, I think that, I think like any like great movies that are serious, I think a lot about movies and data visualization, and I think like great movies that are serious and weighty always have humor in them, and and we're sort of we're missing the humor. I think I miss the humor, and I'm a really serious person, and I but I'm very aware that that needs to be more a part of my own work. Like I, what I'm saying is, I want to figure out how to bring more playfulness into the things that I make myself. Yeah. I was really excited about Raphael's work at, um, at IO this year. And he does that sort of small work that's serious, but it's also sort of fun. Like you get to interact and you hold on to something and then you see your heartbeat and, and, and it's sort of a smaller thing that sort of creates connection between people and it's fun. I like those small kind of, it's, it's serious, but it's also play. Um, you know, last year, I think it was last year, Golden Levin came out with just like a um, graffiti pie chart thing that, you know, you could just put like, you know, make, you know, the unemployment rate in, you know, Cleveland is whatever and, and do graffiti on like the side of the state building or something like this. And I don't, I don't know if it's ever been used, but I really like that, that as a provocation. Um, I shouldn't say this, but there's a lot of concern that there's stasis and that people aren't seeing new things. And I think that I just like to see the field blow up. I think that we that we just we're really attached to the interactive on the screen right now, specifically because of recent tools that have been made. And and I think we're all getting very involved in, in that. This very it's almost like a narrowing of the field before we've even figured out what might be possible. Yeah. The, the only way that you can draw people in, I think, is to tell a story. There's basically, I don't know how else to draw people in. There's either the option of just making really pretty visuals that are kind of explosive and amazing and, and oh my gosh, wow, you know, um, or you can tell a story. I, I, don't, I don't, I think that data and memory, like thinking about those two things together, really brings up the idea of what is truth and, um, Data sort of stands in as fact, and fact being truth. Um, you, you know, your memory might be different from the data, but that doesn't mean that that's not truth. I, 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 so I, there's a over-reliance on data as truth, and maybe an under-reliance on memory as truth, and I, and I think that um, both, both, both things can be true 
and false to the same extent, actually, in general. Uh, the visualization and data creates like the feeling of truth. It's like a truthiness when there's a lot more complexity to it. So there, it's, I mean, I just think that often the truth that we show with data is, is so simplified, like removes so much of the complexity as to actually be false. Um, circles on a, I don't know what these circles on a poster really have to do with like somebody's life in Lesotho. Yeah, put those things together. I'm not sure I wanna go totally in the direction of being an artist and just making like subjective work. But I also know that I don't want to do, you know, I, I don't want to show things and pretend they're objective at all. So that's sort of the, the experiment is how can we put these things together to m maybe make something that represents the world a little bit more, not truthfully, but maybe more appropriately or realistically even, something like that. Yeah. I sort of, I say this thing that like numbers, for me always like numbers and words have never been, never felt different. And the math, when I was doing math, I felt like I was making an argument the same way I make an argument if I write an essay. To me, it all feels the same. And I'd like to create things that have that feeling too. I want to, I'm working on this library visualization project and I really love it if that project, when you looked at it and played with it, felt like reading a great book. Like it's about the library. And and so I, I really would like to make visualization that has that sort of depth. And talking about a lot, we, we were making these interactive tools and I fail to believe that people are actually interacting with them very for very long. And I'd like to make things that people really want to like go deep into. Um, I get really immersed in nature and I get really immersed in books, which is a lot of why I talk about reading. And I mean, I have been reading for almost all of my life and, and reading was really important to me when I was a kid. Um, so for me, reading is very immersive and, and hiking, you know, going out in nature is very immersive. Um, of, um, I get really, really immersed in movies when I watch them. I'm like in the movie, um, in a museum. I like to go to museums and walk around by myself and that's, that's very immersive. Um, that's a really good question. I personally have had immersive experiences with data because I have the tools and the skills to spend the time looking into it. So maybe like part of what I wanna do is make that possible for other people. Yeah. Um, it's like exploring a cave. I don't know, I've never explored a cave, but it feels like it might be what it's like to explore a cave. It's like, it's just like an exploration and it's like a really intuitive exploration. Like, oh, I feel like there might be something interesting here. Let me compare these two columns. Let me like aggregate this way. It's, yeah, it's just like a lot of intuition and guessing and hoping and, and then st starting again and going back in. Yeah. Cave, I want to, make the cave open, um, but in a way that, that makes people want to look around. So maybe that gives people um, some leads so that they're not just blind in there. Um, yeah, yeah. But I'm all about complexity. I just sort of want to be able to show more. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that the, so the experience of a library or a bookstore or even like a video store, anything like that is the experience of browsing in, in, and everybody's saying this now, but the experience of serendipity um, and I name for it. For a while I was, I was thinking that I wanted to make visualizations that were like essays that sort of, uh, essays for me I, are probably my favorite form in terms of putting together really different um, topics much more different than what we're putting together now with visualization. I, I, I'd like to be putting together like, I, I just, I want to create something that's more, and essays have this nuance, and essays have an artistry. Um, so I guess I, I talk about wanting to create like data essays. Uh, um, but then that doesn't quite catch the, the freedom that I want people to have in it. So maybe like a data choose your own adventure essay or something like this. Um, life. 
I measure time in my own life in sort of epochs that are defined by the people I was with and the places I was. Um, so um, I think that I have a very specific group of friends that I made and and I'm very close with through Twitter, which is sort of strange, but we know, you know, but then we've met each other in real life. And, and I think that if you grabbed like all our conversations, you would have actually a pretty good archive of, and sometimes we look at like when, what made this first connection happen? And, and, and I think you would have a pretty good archive of that, actually. Um, what's imp most important for me right now is building community. I worry a lot about very specific things. So I, I worry a lot about prisons in the US. Like there's these very specific things that I have deep concerns about. But I think that what it all boils down to is like the separation between communities. I think that um, when I say I was walking through Harlem and people's immediate reaction is, I've never been there, that I worry about that. I worry about the separation between like self and other. I think that that's in general, like the biggest problem that we, I think it's the fundamental problem that, that we're dealing with. And I think that part of it, Part of that comes from like data. Part of that, I think, comes from the enormous number of people that there are, and that it's very natural and easy to want to group people. Um, and I feel very much that what I'm capable of changing is what I can touch. So I try and create empathy and create connections between different groups as far as I can reach, which is which is kind of far, you know, for, for one person. And then I just sort of hope that that moves beyond. But I don't, I guess I'm not a pessimist or an optimist. I think that like, I think that, you know, blow stuff up and see what happens. I, I don't know, like there's always that vortex, right? So like somebody could make something that I couldn't imagine that sort of changes everything. I I, I bio, which is that, I showed up two years ago and didn't know anyone, and I went on sort of a hunch that, like, um, I had decided I was going to, instead of picking career, pick community, and I was like, I think that this is going to be cool, and so I, you know, bought a ticket and went and didn't know anybody, and that was, like, the best decision I made, and basically, like, you can track everything that's happened to me since then, and the fact that I'm in New York, like, really everything to that hunch of deciding to go to I.O. It was the right choice in terms of community, yeah.